Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am back for Chapter 3, Demand and Supply. Uh, I wanted to apologize to everyone for not putting up some content a little sooner. Uh, I threw my back out this weekend, and uh, I'm in a lot of pain, so stick with me. Um, I'll get I'll get us completely updated by the end of the week, and I will also have some other videos um, uploaded about uh, short papers, homework, what the exam schedule is going to look like, how the exam will work, um, things of that sort. So um, be looking for that. I'll post it in the announcement section once again. Um, all of your chapter notes should be up and ready, uh, and we should be caught up there. Um, I think I uploaded all of that last week. So uh, let's get caught up on the lectures and... Um, like I said, I'll post some other videos about some some sort of non-material stuff. So if you want to pull out your Chapter 3 notes, uh, we'll go over that. And um, in the future, I'm going to try to figure out a way to have the notes up on the screen um, and sort of me just talking in the corners, you know, small, so you don't have to look at my beautiful face. Um, and we can actually, I can point some things out on the screen. So um, I'm in the midst of trying to uh, improve your lectures as well. Like I said, I've never really done this before. So um, it should get better and better as the semester goes on. So, um, okay, chapter three, demand and supply. Uh, this is going to be a very simple and quick chapter. Um, this is probably the most basic concept in economics. Um, so <clears throat> we really need to set a foundation of, of how supply and demand works, how supply and demand curves work, and how you get the sort of uh, supply curve and the demand curve and where they cross. That's the equilibrium price. So uh, what is demand? Uh, the book defines demand as the amount of some good or service consumers are willing and able to purchase at each price. Uh, so remember that demand is not just a singular point. Uh, demand is dependent on price, and as price fluctuates, as we learned in the last chapter, um, demand will fluctuate as well, and we'll also learn that supply will fluctuate as well. Um, so price is sort of driving how much of a thing is demanded and how much is, is supplied. Um, honestly, they're all affecting each other. Uh, demand, supply, and price uh, all have an effect, so it's sort of a cyclical process. Uh, price is just what you pay for a good, of course. Um, so here we see the demand curve. Uh, this is how much of a particular good, here it's gasoline in millions of gallons. Um, so if you look at the line, this is how much would be demanded at each price. And as the price reduces, um, you see much greater demand. Um, and this is exactly how it would work in the real world, right? Uh, as gas prices increase, the demand is reduced because families are having to pinch pennies. Um, individuals will figure out ways to drive less. Uh, companies will try to adjust their logistics and delivery chains so that they can reduce their gas consumption, uh, things like this. And as gas uh, becomes cheaper, of course, demand increases. Um, you know, you might take a wasteful vacation because gas is so cheap. You might sort of get out for the weekend. Um, companies will be a lot less concerned about their logistics lines, things of this sort. Okay, so supply is uh, basically the same exact thing. The amount of some good or service a producer is willing to supply at each price is how the book defines it. Um, and again, depending on price, um, is it has an effect on the amount that is supplied by a particular company or um, a business or a restaurant or a government or an entity, etc. Um, so the more something costs, uh, the more that a company will be willing to produce um, because they're going to get a larger uh, profit margin, right? Um, so when you put this sort of figure 3.3, together with the figure 3.2, you get figure 3.4. Uh, and this is where you find an equilibrium price, right? Um, given the demand curve and given the supply curve that exists for gasoline at particular prices, um, where is the equilibrium price? And that is point E on figure 3.4. Apologies for that. 
spam risk. We don't want that anywhere. Um, so, <clears throat> again, if we're looking at figure 3.4, and uh, what you do is you lay the demand curve from figure 3.2 on top of the supply curve from figure 3.3, and where you get the point E, this is the equilibrium price. Um, so this is the price that both the demand side and the supply side agree um, is the price of a particular good. Um, when you go above that, you start supplying more than point E, so say you're at point S, uh, we have excess supply. And at that point, uh, what happens is supply just sort of sits on the shelf uh, and companies will adjust and stop making supply um, or they'll have to reduce the price to get it off the shelf. Uh, if demand is far above uh, the E equilibrium point, um, that means suppliers are not supplying at the right rate. Uh, we need to be increasing the cost of the product. Um, but just know for this case, what's happening is when you lay the demand curve and the supply curve on top of each other, where they cross or point E is the equilibrium, and that is the price of the product. Okay, in 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 a functioning market, a market that is that is functioning at efficiency and optimum uh, optimality, um, you will get that E price. Now, um, problems come into the system with demand or supply, and you get away from that point E. Um, but that at that point, you're not at your equilibrium. Okay. Uh, so shifts in demands. Um, and supply for goods and services, uh, there are ways to make shifts, right? Um, and before we get into this, we should discuss a, a Latin term that scientists, especially in social sciences, use called ceteris paribus. Uh, ceteris paribus means all other things equal. Um, and that is the assumption that you make when you are conducting modeling and experimentation. Um, you say, okay, here is the dependent variable. Here's the thing we're trying to explain. Um, let's say it's the cost of a product. Um, and here's the independent variable. Um, we want to know how, mm, let's say, weather or climate affects the cost of a product, say, ice cream. Okay, But that means that we need to assume that all other factors that could affect the price of ice cream need to be what's called control variables. And they need to all be set at a specific point or we are just assuming that they are not operative when we want to know how the temperature or the weather affects the price of ice cream. So there could be lots of other things. Um, the price of cream, um, whether mad cow disease exists in the ecosystem right now. Um, all kinds of things that could affect the price of ice cream. Um, but we are assuming, ceteris paribus, that all of those things remain the same and we're just looking at how temperature or weather affects it, okay? Um, if you have questions about that, please reach out to me. Um, it's just the idea that we're, we're assuming that everything else is uh, standard and that we're only really looking at the effect of these two variables, ice cream prices and temperature, okay, where all other things are equal, ceteris paribus. Okay, uh, we should also talk about, very quickly, a normal good versus an inferior good. Um, a normal good is a product whose demand rises as income rises, okay? So this would be things like steak, right? Um, as people, as, as an individual's income rises, um, you're more likely to buy luxury goods, um, and not even necessarily luxury goods, but better quality goods, uh, brand name goods, things of this sort. I um, mean, those are called normal goods. Inferior goods are, <clears throat> are the goods whose demand increases um, as income falls. So as you become more impoverished or as your income falls over time with inflation or you know, whatever, um, your demand for a certain product will increase. And these are, these are um, generic brands. Uh, these are things that um, you would only really need if you're impoverished. Um, so for the vast majority of this course, we're going to be talking about normal goods. Um, when demand increases, 
um, or excuse me, when income increases or expendable income increases or the supply of money increases, etc., um, we're going to be dealing with normal goods when uh, we're going to we're going to demand more of those goods. Okay, um, there there is a whole side of economics that deals with inferior goods. Um, it's really interesting, uh, but it's not necessarily what we're talking about in a beginner's course. Okay. Uh, other factors that could affect demand. Um, there's a lot of factors that, that could affect the demand of a product. It's not just about supply or price. Um, you've got tastes, you've got fashion, you've got advertisement. Um, this is the reason that advertisement exists, right? People wouldn't really care about particular brands or people wouldn't think about a particular brand unless advertisements told you to want them, right? Um, and so these things can affect the demand of a product for, say, a uh, What's a silly product? The slanky, right? This, the blanket that you wear over yourself and has sleeves, right? Nobody really thinks to themselves, "Oh my God, I gotta have a slanky." But, but because of advertising, um, you go, "Well, it's a pretty good idea. I, I think I might want one of those." So, um, uh, demand would be minuscule without the advertising, right? So, so that's something that affects the likelihood of demand. Um, another thing that will affect demand is family size or birth rates or. Um, there, there are all kinds of different things that will affect demand. The, the health of your economy, um, where you live geographically, right? I mean, I'm in Texas. There's not a lot of need for snow shovels here. Whereas in Utah, you guys have a lot of need for snow shovels, right? So um, demand is affected by all kinds of different things. And just please keep that in mind. <clears throat> Uh, one thing that I read from The Economist and that I've read elsewhere um, is one sort of precursor to a recession that they're finding is uh, a drop in the sale of men's socks and underwear. Um, they find that before we know a recession is going to occur, uh, we see at, at aggregate a reduction in, in the sale or the demand of men's underwear and socks. Um, and generally this is because men uh, are sort of thinking ahead about the economy um, and about the bills, I guess. And they are, um, while they may not predict individually that the economy is going to tank in the near future, um, on aggregate, it looks like that men do seem to, to think that way. And to be able to predict that something bad is going to happen in the economy and they stop buying sort of necessity products, um, products that you have some of and you don't really need a replacement at this point. Um, <clears throat> so it's a very interesting phenomenon that, and we're starting to find about some of these uh, precursor products that either increase or decrease um, before economists ever know um, given our normal economic data, that something is about to happen. So uh, it's very interesting. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Okay. Shifts in supply and shifts in demand. Um, if you look at figure 3.9, it shows you a nice little graphic of um, how you can move the supply or the demand curves. Um, something becomes more popular. Uh, incomes rise, um, things of this sort. And then if you want to shift uh, the supply curve, some things that could affect that uh, would be, um, again, popularity, um, the price of substitutes is falling, um, or it could be a new technology that makes the production of a particular item uh, a lot cheaper, and so they'll increase supply. <laughs> okay, we are going to move on to section 3.3, changes in equilibrium price. Um, they say that there's a four-step process. You need to understand the four-step process for determining uh, the equilibrium price. The first is generate the original supply and demand curve. Um, so if you put that together and if you look at figure 3.16 below this four-step process, <clears throat> You have the original supply curve, um, which is S0, and the original demand curve, which is, it looks like D0. Um, so that's the furthest supply curve to the left. And it looks like what we're going to be doing is shifting the supply curve further out to the right, uh, which will eventually reduce the cost of the product. Um, so what you do is you generate the original supply and demand model, 
um, and then you want to try to determine whether the change in the market is affecting demand or supply, that's step two. Um, and then step three is you determine the shift. Um, if, if we decide, as in this case, it's, it's an effect on supply in step two, um, you want to know how is supply moving? Is supply increasing or decreasing depending on the market shift? Um, and then finally, you compare the new equilibrium. So if we moved from E0 to E1, on figure 3.16, um, you'll see you get not only a, a change in the supply curve shifting out to the right from about 200 units to about 600 units, but you also get a concatenated um, change in the price uh, because the demand curve stays equivalent. Um, when you move the supply curve out, it means that the price of the product is going to be reduced, and that means that the <clears throat> The buyer, the purchaser, uh, the individual, etc., will get um, the benefit from the increase in supply um, as as price is reduced as as a um, uh, as price is reduced as um, a result of the the move in the supply. Okay, uh, section three point four. Uh, we're really not going to talk much about. Um, it's about price ceilings and price floors. Um, governments can act uh, enact price floors or price ceilings. Um, so we're seeing that right now, actually, with the Biden administration talking about um, shifting the minimum wage from what I believe right now is $7.75 to $15. Um, <clears throat> that would be what's called a price floor uh, for labor. Um, labor is a product, uh, at least in economic parlance. Um, and because labor is a product, um, supply and demand uh, are are part of the equation right and so if you shift the the minimum wage or the price of labor up um, it's going to reduce demand and maybe even reduce supply um, it'll be very interesting to see what happens in the past usually what happens is the government lags the minimum. I have a reminder for Allie. Uh, generally, in, in the past, what happens is uh, the federal minimum wage lags the average wage anyway. And so, um, at least during the Obama administration, when they moved it from $5.15 minimum wage to $7.25, I believe, under the Obama administration, um, the the low end of the wage structure was already above that 725. There were almost a, a very, very small proportion of the population was actually making minimum wage. And this is usually somewhere between 1% and 2% of the population, um, at least here in America. This will be interesting, however, because this, this shift in the minimum wage is different from in the past where minimum wage was lagging the sort of natural wage anyway. Um, this time, it looks like we will push past the natural wage, which looks to be around $9 or so in America, $9 per hour. We're going to move past that natural wage and, and bump it up to 15 which is a sort of a massive increase, especially in some rural places. Um, here in Texas, it'll have a big effect. Maybe in Utah, I'm not really sure about your local economy. Um, Whereas in other places like Washington State, Oregon, New York, California, probably won't have that much of an effect. Um, but some places it will have a substantial effect uh, on the population and especially on the impoverished population. So um, it'll be very interesting to watch what the effect is because we, we don't really know at this point what the effect might be uh, because we've never really pushed the minimum wage like this before. So um, lots of words and a whole long thing to talk about price floors. Uh, a minimum wage is a price floor, right? Um, price ceilings. This might be rent control. It might also be sometimes the government will put a cap on how much a pharmaceutical company can charge for a medicine. Um, and so this might be another example of a price ceiling, right? And they distort the market. Um, and we'll talk more about uh, the, the distortions that occur and how all of that stuff occurs in the future. Um, but just know that these sort of price ceilings and price floors can distort the market. Um, <clears throat> let's see. 
Uh, the last section is about efficiency. So if you look at the demand and supply curve, um, it looks like we're in figure 3.23. Um, efficiency is the E dot, like I was talking about earlier. Um, that we're utilizing our economy at its most efficient point. Um, anytime you get away from that, we're becoming inefficient, either on the demand side or the supply side. And this can be bring big problems into your economy. Um, it can mean that you're overproducing and that eventually you'll have too much of a product. It can mean you're underproducing and that um, your citizenry is having to buy product from foreign countries, say, or they just can't get their hand on a product. Or um, So there can, there can be real world um, issues with under or overproducing or uh, under or over demanding. But just know that the E point is the efficiency point and, uh, or the equilibrium point. Um, later in the course, we'll talk about Nash equilibriums. Um, uh, Nash from the film A Beautiful Mind. Uh, he was a world famous economist who won the Nobel Prize um, for some of his works on, on equilibriums. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about him later. The movie doesn't really explain much of what his theories were, so I, I, I wouldn't suggest it unless you really want to watch it, but um, just know that that's what a Nash equilibrium is, and we'll, we'll start to talk about some of that stuff later uh, in the semester as well. So, that is Chapter 3. Um, thank you all for sticking with me. Uh, I will have some at least one more chapter up today. I'm planning on having two up today, but it takes some time to get everything uploaded. Uh, and then I will also have a, a short video on, on your short papers, on exams, on question and answer sessions, all this kind of stuff. So uh, be looking out in the announcements. Have a great day. Hope you enjoy the lecture. And uh, keep working hard. Thanks.